everything I've been writing has sort of been baloney because whether you say it or not in an article, everything I was doing was based on the feeling that in a democracy, political power comes from the ballot box, from being elected from the people. Yet here was a man who was never elected to anything, and he had enough power to turn an entire state government around in a single day, and I had no idea, and actually neither did anybody else, where he got this power from. And it was then that I thought that if I really want to write about politics truthfully, I have to find out, because no one knew, where he got his power and how he had been using it for so long. And did you think, Bob, after that um, defining moment of finding that, that uh, a project that was so... Uh, you know, looked at objectively and dispassionately, should not have been approved, and then it was overwhelmingly approved. Did you expect then to find such an incredible um, network and accumulation of power? Did, did you have any foretaste, any foreknowledge of the sheer massive extent of how in yeah. so many of the uh, commissions and departments yeah. of New York City the power of this man would run into them? That's a terrific question because that's exactly what happened. So then I started to think, so we lived on Long Island, we would drive on the Long Island Expressway which he built, the Southern State Parkway, which he built, the Northern State Parkway, when we had a day off, we'd go to Jones Beach when he built, or one of his other parks that he built. If we went to New York City, we'd go to Lincoln Center, which he was responsible for, or the United Nations. Robert Moses arranged that. So I gradually came to feel, this was, I'm making myself sound like it all came to me too quickly. It was gradually, I said, my God, this one man created the entire landscape in which we live. And then you looked at his career and you said, he's been in power for 44 years. He's been in power through six governors and five mayors. He shaped the whole world in which we live. Uh, how, did, how, did he, how did he do it, do you know? What, what is the story here? So I originally thought I would do this as a long newspaper series, but I came to realize I could never do that. I'd have to do it in a book. I must say no one was really interested in publishing the book. I, we st I started it for what is really, Einer and I used to call the world's smallest advance. And the publisher that we had, uh, my first publisher, really wasn't, and he used to say, I gave him about half the book at some point because I needed more money, which he wouldn't give me because he said, I guess you don't understand, Bob, this is a good book. We like it here, but no one is going to buy a book on Robert Moses. I remember his exact words. So we're not prepared to go beyond the terms of the contract, which meant you'll get your other half when you finish and not before. <laughs> and this was um, the book that turned that, that this what was going to be a long article yes. is now the the twelve hundred page book yes. and is now being published in the UK and yes. which I think you wrote you wrote much more than that yes okay. well <laughs> the book as you read it or hold it is seven hundred thousand words but it was in fact not as a rough draft but as a finished polished book. A million fifty thousand words, <laughs> which is one. Th so we had. So I asked my editor. By this time, I had switched publishers to an editor who was very good publisher, who was really very supportive. And I said, "Can't we do it in two volumes?" And he said, "I." He used the word "I" a lot. I might get people interested in Robert Moses once. I could never get them interested in him <laughs> twice. <laughs> Well, how wrong he was. I think um, if, if many of us would think that if that uh, original version was still existing mm -hmm. somewhere, we would happily go out and buy it. Well, uh, thank think, you. Because <laughs> this is a, for those who haven't read yet, The Power Broker, Robert Moses and the, and the Fall of New York, which, which I obviously strongly recommend, it is an amazing tale. And I think, I think it would be worth telling people tonight, for those who haven't read it, how Robert Moses exercised that 
power. How did he, in a, what's your short, briefest description you could make of um, how a man never elected to public office for more than 40 years held this power over mayors, over governors, over the chairman of every commission, over congressmen? What was the, the source of that power? You ask terrific questions. I'm not, that, that's hard to answer fast, but I'll try. So Robert Moses, when he was young, thought he was going to be elected, either mayor or governor. But Moses' personality was that of a dictator. His, his gesture when in public speaking was to smack down his hand on, on the podium. His person, and so he ran for governor. When the campaign started, he was the most popular figure in New York State. He lost, but during the election, people got a look at him. And he lost by what is still to this day the largest majority anyone ever lost by in New York. So he realized that he was never going to get elected. Now, Moses was quite a brilliant man. One thing I hope we get a chance to talk about was his, his brilliance. Mm -hmm. What he did was he took a yellow legal pad into a little room adjoining the office that he had. And he drafted legislation, I, I'll oversimplify here, that nobody understood. But buried in the legislation, it, it, it was ostensibly legislation to create public authorities, which had already been, but to make something different out of public authorities and to create new ones. And buried in these pages and pages, there are 41 pages of, the, of one document, that are, are these sentences which contradict then people thought of public authorities as something that uh, sells bonds to get money to build, let's say, a bridge, collects tolls until the bonds are paid off, and then goes out of business. Ostensibly, in the first few pages, that's what this legislation did. But buried in around page 31 or something were sentences which completely negated that and basically gave the chairman of the tribe over of his different authorities, he had 12 at one time, gave them power to keep refinancing bonds so they could stay in business forever and the chairman could stay in business forever and the chairman had absolute power. Now how, what, so for 40 years, if you were driving a car in the city of New York and you went through a bridge or a tunnel and you paid a quarter or a half a dollar or whatever the toll was then, you were basically paying it directly to Robert Moses. So the average annual surplus from these authorities was, it's been so long since I wrote this book, this figure may be wrong, I think was $32 million a year. The city of New York was in effect bankrupt, at the most it had two or three million dollars a year. So the contracts for public works in New York were given out by Robert Moses. He didn't have to go to anybody else, a board of estimate or a city council. He could decide himself who got contracts. And he would decide on the basis, let's say that you have a bridge, you have insurance, uh, you have to have insurance policies on that bridge. But the bridge is not going to fall down. This is before the age of terrorism. So whoever, whatever brokers are going, insurance brokers are going to get this, uh, are just going to make money. He would give out the commissions on the basis of what politicians controlled how many votes in the assembly of the state of New York. He would give public relations retainers to the right public relations men, legal fees to the lawyers, uh, Bond, the bond underwriting to bond underwriters, uh, contracts to the right contractors. Moses himself was completely honest. He had no interest in money. But he made himself, in effect, the lo I think I used the phrase in the book, the locus of corruption in New York. He was the system so that nobody who was elected could oppose him because the system would then make sure they were out of office. I think I've oversimplified that but a lot. But no, but, but I, well, I think that's, um, 
as ever, brilliantly described, including the people who haven't heard this story before, of, of creating independent authorities, creating overlapping terms of office, overlapping. so that he was always beyond the reach of uh, elected you officials. Ju you just said, a, I forgot, overlap. So he made sure that his term, there were four-year terms, as his they never ended in the same year. So a mayor might want to... Um, uh, oust him as head of one authority, but he'd still be in power for, with, with 11 more. It's a very interesting, he pursu in order to do this, he had to get the mayor of New York, the legendary Fiorello LaGuardia, a, very a man who liked power himself and was quite brilliant in power. He persuaded LaGuardia that these, that these legislation that was really just standard legislation. So LaGuardia, uh, approved it for the legislature, and the legislature passed it. There comes a point, a year or two later, when LaGuardia, they have a dispute, and LaGuardia writes Moses. We find this letter in LaGuardia saying, listen, you're not the boss here, I'm the boss here. Robert Moses writes back in hand across the letter, Mayor, you better read the contract. <laughs> <laughs> And your argument, Bob, is that uh, one of your arguments in this book, and, and, in the, and it's a parallel argument, I think, to, um, to your books on Lyndon Johnson, which we will come on to, is that, uh, as, as you put it, that the, the cliche says that power always corrupts, but what is seldom said is that power always reveals. Uh, if I continue the quote, you say, when a man is climbing, trying to persuade others to give him power, concealment is necessary. But as a man obtains more power, camouflage becomes less necessary. Yes. Um, and uh, tell us about what was revealed of Robert Moses as he accumulated this enormous power in New York. Well, when he was young, and he was when he had these great dreams of dreams like Jones Beach, the power was he wanted power for the sake of his dreams, um, and he created some great dreams. But as you know, power in many ways is like a drug. If you use it, you need more larger and larger doses. Moses was a real user, and. As the decades pass, and remember we're talking about a career of almost half a century, 44 years, the things that he selects to build, he, builds on, he selects on the basis of what can give him more power. And instead of building the beautiful parks and parkways, the real power is in public housing. So if you come to New York on your next trip, when you can see, if you want to, as you're flying in, if you're flying into Kennedy, um, on your left, you're gonna see a, when Manhattan Island starts, for like two and a half miles from the tip of Manhattan Island up, you're gonna see a dull red, reddish brick wall of buildings. It's hundreds of apartment houses. That's low-income housing, most, most of it. And when you see this housing, what we didn't talk about, we talked about, Moses, Moses was a very racist man. He was one of the most racist individuals, actually, that, that I've ever encountered in my life. And he, and he also was a very arrogant man. Um, he didn't want to do things for the poor. Can I just interject? Mm -hmm, so he built um, Jones Beach, this beautiful beach, uh, was an inspiration for him to find this sandbar and build this beach on it, but he didn't want poor people using it, and he particularly didn't want poor people of color using it. So if you happen on your trip to New York to get into a car and drive out to Jones Beach, you will find bridge, as you drive on the parkways, you'll find bridge after bridge, it will say clearance 10 feet 9 inches, clearance 11 feet, clearance 9 feet 8 inches. The reason is that buses need clearance of 14 feet. And he didn't, in the 1930s when he built Jones Beach, poor people didn't generally have car. 
cars, so that he was afraid that they would reach Jones Beach by public transportation. Well, it was easy for him to make sure that the Long, I the Long Island Railroad said, well, we'll build a spur to Jones Beach, but it was with his political power, he could just stop that. But he was afraid that in decades to come, people would come out there by buses. So he had, law, law, he had had laws passed saying that buses could not use his parkway. But his chief aide, who spoke to me with amazing frankness, said to me, well, you know, laws can be changed, but it's very hard to tear down a bridge once it's up. So he built, Robert Moses built 178 of these bridges that are too low for buses to go through. So when this public housing, when, he, when I started to say, this is why my books are so long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we're enjoying it just like we enjoy the books. <laughs> well, this public housing was where the power was, because that was where the federal money was going. So he moved into public housing. This is moved into the field of public housing. This is a man who really did not like the poor. He used to feel if he was giving people charity, he wanted them to understand they were getting charity. He wanted to make poor people feel poor. So when you look at these buildings, what you will see is that there's not one piece of architectural immunity on it, not a finial, not a little design in brickwork. They're just like boxes with windows. So Robert Moses, when he was in public housing, built 155,000 apartments. He built a, 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 a 1,028 apartment buildings, six, seven, eight-story buildings, with a total of 155,000 apartments which housed almost half a million people at that time. This is the public housing of New York to this day. Uh, and he built it in areas he didn't want the poor people mixing with middle class. So that he contributed only now, a half century later, is New York recovering and starting to blend in housing. But uh, when you asked before how power you know, changes people, Sometimes it can cleanse people, and um, there are people that I've written about who when they get power, suddenly they're freed to do things for people. But in Moses' case, it just intensified the way he had always been.